expertise. I am the owner and facilitator of the Mental Dialogue Community Support Group focused on practical solutions and the collective thinking of the black community. We do that one of two ways, every Tony Friday, 7 p.m. at Urban Grind, or Saturday mornings, the Mental Dialogue Talk Show, 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Contact us at mentaldialogue.com or on Facebook at Mental Dialogue. All I ask is that you think. What's up everybody, it's your boy Montoya Smith, AKA Black Socrates, and welcome to our first Mental Dialogue Facebook Live. I'm so glad to be doing this. Most of y'all that are longtime followers, y'all know typically we would be at Urban Grind right now supporting Cassandra, but obviously we are in, are doing our social distancing right now, and so we were bringing it to you live instead of live in 3D at Urban Grind, a black-owned coffee shop in Midtown here in Atlanta. I have two special guests with me as we're again pulling off our first Mental Dialogue Facebook live show. I have Shadon Reynolds to my right as well as Latrice Ross to my left. So I'm so glad to have both of these queens for our first Mental Dialogue live show. Again, we will be doing the Mental Dialogue live experience and so instead of just doing the the regular talk show as you just saw in the commercial again a talk show every saturday morning 10 a.m to 12 p.m and the live experience every third friday but instead of just doing a talk show i wanted to bring a few aspects to see get this thing kicked off as we get people in on the facebook live with us hopefully y'all are getting in make sure y'all are sharing it so we are in for a treat with this Mental Dialogue Live experience, if you're a first time listener, let me tell you this, we are the best in the world at doing hard conversations on race, sex, and gender. But before we kick off our conversation, we've been letting people vote all day on what our conversation would be. So if, again, if you are a follower and you saw that earlier, and we got a lot of votes on what our topic will be. Before I re reveal our topic of discussion um, this, this evening, I wanted to do a little movie trivia like we do when we at the live experience, right? You know, the live experience, we always have an icebreaker. And so I said, let me just try this, see if it works. We're going to do a little icebreaker. Um, and if you will, if you're out there listening, you can answer these questions. If one of my guests, they don't get the answer to the question, y'all can type it in. And we're going to see how many questions <laughs> y'all can get. These are classic black movies, classic black movie trivia. And so we want to see what y'all remember from these classic black movies as well as the audience. We want to make sure they're participating as well. So we're going to do a little, again, a little trivia just to get this thing started, to get people in on the show with us. And as we get people in the, on the show, we'll go to a quick commercial, reveal what our topic of discussion is, and hopefully um, get y'all in on it. Sounds good? Sounds good. All right, so before we get asked the questions, well, let me make sure I'm fair enough to my guests. Again, this is our first Facebook Live. So done, if you will, give a little bit of your background before we start asking these questions. Go ahead, Queen. Okay, then. So, hey, Facebook world. I hope you guys are enjoying the social distancing. I will say that I am not. I realized as I was writing here today that social distancing will be my kryptonite, and I am just praying that it is over sooner than later because I love people. Um, and with that, I am Shadar Reynolds. I am the CEO of She Prints It LLC. We are a promotional products and branding agency that's committed to making sure that your business can play in the sandbox with the big boys and keep your brand top of mind. I've also been able to use that platform to extend my passion project, to which you see me wearing today, as well, along with my queen. Uh, on the side of me, which is our She Wear Club, it's our retail line. It is really all about creating bold, fully stated conversation piece apparel that is really catered to the love and like of women in particular. So that is who I am, that is what I do, but most importantly, I am a mother um, of two beautiful little people, and I am a proud wife to a king, um, and so all that I do, I do for them. All right, Latrice, if you will, introduce yourself to our audience this evening. Hello, Mental Dialogue audience. I'm Latrice Ross. I am a diversity and inclusion consultant. Um, I've been doing this for about seven years, and I'm absolutely passionate about all things diversity and inclusion, particularly when it comes to gender equity and um, issues around um, forward thinking towards our black community. So those are the things that drive me um, intrinsically and that I do um, without thought of payment because it's for the betterment of either black women or the 
black community as a whole. So that's who I am. I have, um, I'm gonna give a shout out to my kids. I have four beautiful children, two boys, two girls, and one most adorable grandson. And oh, I'm sorry, I now have a first grandbaby as well. His oh. name is Milo. <laughs> <laughs> you better count them for a baby. I know, so um, I'm excited to get this conversation started. All right, sounds good. Well, just so everybody know, all of this this broadcast is being brought to you by Jericho Broadcasting. Again, she presses as a sponsor tonight, as well as Big Sis Media and Money Motivation. As you see the hat here, as y'all will see their commercials. Before we get started again, before we even open up the bag on discussion for this evening, we're going to start out with a couple of y'all. Can't listen, y'all already cheating. I can tell y'all looking. <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm, joking. I'm, joking. I'm, joking. I'm, joking. I'm gonna lose fair and square. <laughs> <laughs> if it was books, I'd have it, but movies, no. <laughs> All right, and so again, if anybody out there is looking, if y'all want to put the answers in the comment, just in case these ladies have a little trouble with the questions, y'all can help us out. Again, we're just going to do this for a few minutes just to get everything going and hopefully get some of the audience in on our first Facebook Live. All right, with that said, what movie starred Wesley Snipes as Nino Browns? I'm going to actually, I'm, I believe you that, I believe you know that. I'm going to start to say pass. Where's the she was trying to help you out right Where's there. The button you got it. You, the you up. <laughs> New Jack City. New Jack City is absolutely okay. correct. Never uh, saw it. I, 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 I. <laughs> Never saw it. Never saw it. Did you I was just not saying something about the empowerment of people earlier? I've been doing that through books. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? And you ain't seen New Jack City. <laughs> I can give you a few titles you like to have not read. Uh, <laughs> Facts. That's okay. I'll cover y'all on a movie tip. Don't worry about that. I got you. I got Thank you. Catch y'all on the book. Right. Thank you. So, and together we're better. Absolutely. Uh, we're going to start with you this time, Shadon. As we okay. see, this is probably going to she says she's going to lose. She says she's going to lose fair and square. As we already know. You can't I get lose, that, that first. That is not going to be a good look, right? <laughs> <laughs> I know. If you, yeah, if you lose, it, that will be bad. Because she didn't get that one. I'm about, to, I'm about to search for one that she might be here. Right. Uh, here we go. We're okay. going to start with you. Okay. What movie starred Ice Cube as Doughboy? Doughboy? Is that my friend? No. Uh, Menace to Boys in the Hood. Boys in the Hood. Boys in the Hood. It's correct. Right. I did. Boys in the Hood. I went backwards. All right. Sounds good. Sounds good. All right. Let's try this one. Let's okay. try this one. I'm, I'm a, since you almost got a Boys in the Hood question, I'm going to give you another one. Give you a chance. Who directed Boys in the Hood? John Singleton. There you go. There you uh, go. Oh, oh, social distancing. Oh, 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 yeah. How you feel? Hey, like she that, knew my boyfriend. Hey, hey, like that lady that was telling everybody, <laughs> don't touch their face, and she licked her finger. Y'all saw that no, one? Wait, no. Oh, my God. You no, see no. that one? You see that one? Yeah. Uh, here we go. Here we go. I'm on subject. Uh, he, he mentioned somebody right. looking at me. That threw me all out. <laughs> all right, here we go. Here we go. This is a hard one for you, but I got to give her a chance. Okay. Right now, it's two to one. Two to one. All right, let's give you a hard one. I want to figure. Oh, I no, 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 it's two to one. one. It's two to one. She got two. She got two. She got the first two. Oh, two moves. You trying to steal your point. She trying to steal your point. Right, and I thought we was cool. We fell out. All right, I'm going to give you a hard one to give her a chance. But she won't get it. She I'm trying to figure out why he. I, I'm, I want to know why you don't think it's hard. Because if it's some like. All right, here we go. Let's try. Anything, I'm not so smart. What movie starred <laughs> Samuel L. Jackson as Gator? Gator. Yes. Mm -hmm. Anybody back in the, in the audience know? Uh, uh, how you doing? I'm eat three seconds. One, uh, two, one, thousand. Uh, all right, there's a pass. You want to take a shot at that one? Absolutely not. All right, I'll give it to the audience. <laughs> Jungle Fever, the I audience has you, one point. Fever. One point for the I audience, one point for her, and two for you. <laughs> all right, let's throw it back. Okay. We're going to throw it back to Latrice. Yeah, they remember he was, he was Gator. In the, he was the crackhead. I, I remember his role, but I didn't remember his name. Right, right, right. Yeah, his first major role. That was his first major role. That was his first major role. Uh -huh. He was now fresh out of rehab, too. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah that's why he was so good at it. Yep. And now he's made four movies. Do I get a half a point? Okay. <laughs> All right, cool, cool. Let's do one more before we go to the break. How about that? One more. All right, give her a chance to tie it up. Chris Tucker and Ice Cube starred in what comedy together? Friday. Hey! <laughs> Alright, alright, alright. So we'll, so we'll let it be in time. We'll let it be in time. Two for you, two for you, and one for the audience. How about that? So
So we are going to go to a commercial. When we come back, we're going to open up the phone lines and get this discussion started. We'll be right back. you are listening to the Mental Dialogue Facebook Live. All I ask is that you think. All my life, been grinding all my life. Sacrifice, hustle, pay the price. Wanna slice, got to roll the dice. That's why, all my life, I've been grinding all my life. Yeah. All my life, been grinding all my life. Sacrifice, hustle, pay the price. Wanna slice, got to roll the dice. That's why, all my life, I've been grinding all my life. Are you motivated? Better yet, are you motivated to act? Don't chase the bag, attract the bag. It's the Money Motivation Podcast. An unscripted view into the game of money, assets, dividends, forex, trust funds, commodities, futures, the money motivation. Welcome back to the Mental Dialogue Facebook Live. I'm your host, Montoya Smith, a.k.a. Black Socrates. Two special guests with me, Shadon Reynolds to my right, as well as Latrice Ross to my left. We're going to go ahead and kick off this evening's discussion question as we did a little movie trivia prior to the break. Again, this is our first Facebook Live show. But to get this more this evening's, I'm so used to doing the morning show. So to get this evening's um, discussion started, we gave out five options earlier today, and the qu discussion question that the audience selected was: Is colorism better or worse in 2020? Is colorism within the black community better or worse in 2020? And I must say for myself, I was actually surprised of all the five options. We we basically gave out the, the popular shows from our talk show that we do every Saturday morning, and that was the one that people selected. I was a little surprised by that selection. Um, actually, gonna, I'll actually start with you, Latrice, as one of my regular co-hosts on the audio show, if you will, as I always do on the show, we're going to do it here. What's your initial thoughts now that you just heard what the discussion question all is? all the topics, why that one? Right. Yeah, <laughs> right. I was surprised myself. That was the first thought. Um, and then I start to think about colorism and, and its role in today and and you know I I don't necessarily think it's worse but I don't think it's better I think we've just been continuing the trend that's always existed all right and here we go you just heard it first thought when you just heard that that's what they said the group the audience selected prior to the um, show you know I totally piggyback on what she's saying that my first thought is that of all things but once I dig deeper into why that was my first thought. I think it's just, I've come to live with it. Um, that that is just the norm. I have basically gotten comfortable and adjusted with the idea of all the things that I've kind of grown up with. Oh, you're pretty for a dark skinned girl. And you know, the assumption that the good hair and bad hair and pretty eyes and all these things. And you just learn to just push past them. Otherwise, for me, you know, I realize I'm either gonna move past it or let it destroy me. And ironically, until what, three, four years ago, I thought I was a dark sneaker. Mm. Until one of my coworkers told me I would not, that I would pass the paper bag test. Yeah. So, and it shocked me that she would even use that term in this day and age, but she's like, stop playing, you, pass, you, know, you, you would pass the back, the back. Well, when I first moved to Georgia, I realized that one of the radio personalities, a pretty big personality, which, oh hell, why would I not name him? Like he gonna do something to me. Um, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> say you scared. Um, you know, right. Look, tap, tap my head and whoever that. Um, that just said my age, did um, But Frank Ski, I remember, Frank Ski used to have parties at a club and they were paper bag parties. Like, you, if you didn't pass this paper bag, that was the difference between if you what? paid or didn't pay. Yes. And that was really not that long ago. Facts. Wow. And I think that that's a part of that social conditioning that you're just like, whatever, it is what it is. And so I think in our community, we try to make light of things that we should not make light of. And we get caught up in mess like that, where you have a paper bag test. And because he's lighter complected, he's you know mixed race, it probably didn't even dawn on him as much so that that's not cool. But for somebody like me, 
to know that I could not be um, welcome into a club or have to pay more than somebody that's lighter skin is a very real thing. I'm blown away because I'm blown away. I, I definitely. I guess I passed and never, yeah, I never, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying I don't believe you, I'm yeah. just blown away that it was so recent. Yeah. Um, because when I say it surprised me, what happened for me was, I feel like some of the things y'all just mentioned, I, maybe in my little relative world, I thought that I was seeing that a lot less. I'm talking about the things that I remember vividly growing up, growing up in South Carolina, mm -hmm. and colorism being a very, very real thing. Yeah. I remember to the extent of, how light skin was looked at versus dark skin. And I'm not naive to the sense that it has gone, like the idea that it's gone completely away. Mm -hmm. But I actually made assumptions that the, and I think of the younger people when I thought of mm -hmm. it. I, was, I thought they experienced that a lot less. Partly, and the reason I thought oh, it, was a bad, it was a bad assumption, clearly mm -hmm. people want to talk about this, right? right? But I'm saying the reason I made that assumption was because to a certain extent, now they're growing up in an era where we are starting to finally appreciate our melanin. And maybe it's so new yeah. that it hasn't taken hold. And to even give more context, this is the radio show I'm on now is like a five year run on the blog talk, right? But it wasn't the first time I was on the radio. Mm -hmm. And the, the first time I was on the radio, I actually used to do the show like on a Sunday night and I got connected to uh, like a African American uh, diversity thing mm -hmm. was co college out in um, California, mm -hmm. so they were they were required. I was required to listen, which was pretty cool for me or whatever. Okay, okay, yeah. But one time I asked them, I want y'all to pick the topics. They were just whatever we were doing. They were mm -hmm. listening to or whatever they were talking about it in their class with money. But I asked them to pick a topic, and this has been a number of years ago. And when they were picking their own topics. This is the same topic that came wow. to fruition for that they wanted to do. Yeah. And I've never forgotten that. Yeah. I never forgot. And I was like, is this their experience? And I thought it had changed. Yeah. And when I say I thought it had changed, I can vividly remember the term red bone, which I don't think you mm -hmm. hear as much now. I think that's a part of when I think about just racism in general, right? And so people say we've evolved from it. And I don't think that it's necessarily we've evolved to the extent that we think we have. It's just that there's so much more political correctness. And I think the same thing is happening with colorism. So you may not hear red bone, but then there's other terms that are still being used or if the conversation is being redirected in a way because even when I think about commercials and things like that, like they're trying to celebrate blacks a little bit more, but it's still the light-skinned woman with the curly hair. And even when they're celebrating the idea that we are natural now, it's still celebrating natural curl patterns and all the products are showing how you can go wet and wavy and you know all this stuff. And that's just not reality for, I won't say all, because hair is, different across the board, but that's not the association of hair and natural hair with black women, darker complected women. And that's I what I was going to say is that it may not be spoken about, like, you know, hearing the term red bone, but you see it manifested itself in the movies and the commercials, even in um, the types of jobs that people get or the promotional opportunities that come about in the corporate space. Um, because there's definitely a different perception about a dark-skinned woman versus a lighter-skinned woman. Mm -hmm. And even how it was brought up to me in the corporate setting that I was light-skinned, um, she, the, my coworker, my colleague was telling me that when I would open a lunch and learn that I was very enthusiastic and she said, well, you can get away with that because you're light-skinned. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what are you talking about? I'm not light-skinned. And she gave me an example that you know, she was excited mm -hmm. because she had figured out code. And she, she was a program, computer programmer, and she figured out code and she was sort of celebrating with her coworker. And when she walked away, her supervisor walked up and wanted to know why was she upset. Mm. Because, and she took it as, here I am, this darker skinned woman. Yeah. I'm, I'm expressing the same enthusiasm and excitement that Latrice expresses, but I'm perceived differently Absolutely. than she is, and she felt it was, it was due to her darker skin. Yeah. So well, let me ask you this about that situation. Um, and that was, I'm assuming, in the corporate based on the mm -hmm. background, was at a corporate setting. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in that, I think I see this in two lights. So the situation you just said, I've definitely heard of, very aware of, definitely know the same thing happens for, for example, dark-skinned men. 
how they're uh, often will appear more menacing or whatever to the to the majority of society, if you will. So in that setting, I was very aware that that's still very real. Mm -hmm. When I think of colorism, I'm just talking about within our yeah. own community. Again, both count, both rare, right. both count. So I'm not. I'm just want to put them in context and talk about even within our own community. So, for example, like I said, the term red bone or whatever, I remember as a young man, if somebody, if you was getting introduced to someone and said they were told, I'm, and I want to introduce you to this girl and she's a red bone, that was a highlight. Like that's, that's, that's how we received yeah. that as young men when I was growing up. And right. so there was always this issue that what I would hear the, the older people say wasn't something that we would say, as you kind of said, it evolves, if you will. Mm -hmm. But I, would, I, I learned later, older people were, you know, life, right, damn your wife. Like, that wasn't something mm -hmm. that my generation was saying. I heard, I heard about that later. Right. But we still was carrying on Absolutely. that, the, in a sense, the light-skinned woman, in a sense, mm -hmm. was a red bone and she was better. Like, just yeah. off the top, that was the automatic thought. So just showing how embedded that was in, you know, in us. But I also, to uh, flip it, for men, we don't have the experience, I don't think, as much as y'all still have experiences with that, um, in my opinion. Yeah. And, and, and I'll tell you the point I thought it changed. Literally, we you should see comedians laugh about how Wesley Snipe in New Jack City, so happened mm -hmm. to be, he was kind of like a, the, the lead and was the man in that movie. Mm -hmm. And so you should see comedians talk about how light-skinned men were the thing in music. Mm -hmm. And then Wesley Snipe comes and becomes that lead in New Jack City, and right. dark skinned men became in, even for the ladies. Yeah. That was like a real running joke amongst comedians. Yeah. And I think, I feel like personally, I witnessed that. The shift. Yeah, the shift. So for men, it got better. I don't know if it ever necessarily got better for, for you as ladies. So what I'd like to say, I think that what we see is more darker skinned women loving the skin that they're in than we saw in the past. Correct. But I don't necessarily think that other people of color see them that way. When you look at, if you go and look at Twitter or Facebook or Instagram, the types of insults that other black women will heap on a darker skinned black woman, black woman wow. are entirely different than what they would heap onto a lighter skin. Yeah. And, and I'm saying, I feel like it is worse. I feel like it's worse for y'all than it, it is for us as men. It's, That's well, what I'm saying. It's definitely worse for black women in general. And I think that then there becomes levels, you know what I'm saying? Like at the end of the day, black women are on the bottom of the totem pole, no matter what we do, no matter how many, you know, strides we make in this world, we're just, we're always considered in last place. Um, and then within that, there's levels, you know what I'm saying? So it's like, well, if I have to tolerate a black woman, I would rather tolerate a fair skinned, light skinned black woman over a darker skinned woman because there's these negative associations with with color so just like what you were saying earlier is that <clears throat> i've been accused of being aggressive way more times than not and i always try to explain to people i'm just a very passionate person when i'm excited about something or i'm committed to something or i believe in something i'm passionate white women have the ability to be passionate and to some degree, lighter skinned women have that space too. Meaning in a room amongst all black women, the lighter skinned woman could be more loud and aggressive. And even in, even in a more threatening way, she could be getting up and, you know, doing the most and folks will have her back. Now, I don't know if she can get away with the head. Or something like Within a circle of black women, she could. Because oh, okay, 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 yeah, I'm no, thinking. no, no, I'm saying okay, gotcha. if, if you're in a room with white women, then white women get away with it first, next in line will be the lighter skinned gotcha. black woman, and we will be last on the totem pole, but in a room, like you're saying, and we're just talking about within our own community, the black woman, the darker skinned black woman is considered to be aggressive, no matter what, most of the time when I'm talking, I'm smiling at the same time, but it's, I, I'm still in, in most of the time it's by black women wow. it's black women and don't get me wrong because uh, it's a whole other conversation about the brothers and how y'all perceive us and the responses that you guys give to us and, and that's a whole other ball game but definitely I believe that women need to learn to love 
their selves first in turn we can learn to love each other and then we can train other people on how to treat us i think that we let me, let me go to a comment we got a comment out there yes uh hello everyone just to, to kind of give a couple of quick comments uh walter vinson actually had two comments that go directly to what you were just saying first he says skin tone is relative compared to whom you were standing next to yeah. um and then he also comes in and says he's been in georgia all, all i've been in georgia all my life and all we do is describe each other by ice cream flavors coffee blends before anything else we are obsessed with the tone of the hair texture we have so many nicknames for skin tones. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I, what's the um, gymnast name who's breaking all the records? And what's her name? Oh, um. That uh, just did the little. Yeah, just, just did the new thing. You, okay, it'll come to me. Not about. the one that Beyonce. Oh, the, 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 the one that the Olympian. Break up, yeah. um, Simone she gets Biles. 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 She gets I'm more Simone Biles. insults Biles. from black women about her about hair, hair and her skin than anyone else. Yes. Yeah. And she's a world-class athlete Absolutely. who continues to break records. But the only thing that other black women see, what are you going to do with your hair? Or why are you so ashy? I or just, just craziness coming from other black women instead of applauding her considerable achievements. Absolutely. They try to tear her down based on her appearance. Absolutely. But even with the conversation of hair, uh, that that like you were saying you had somebody comment on your post you know after a workout did, did you know get your hair done that is a constant conversation and I'm natural underneath my little braids and my my wrap but people have no idea how much is how much work it is to even get my afro to sit a certain way yeah that's um, something you gotta call it you gotta call it let's take the call Welcome to the face, the Mental Dialogue Facebook Live. You're live on the air. What's your name, where you're calling from, and give us your three cents on this evening's discussion question. <laughs> oh, man. You, you, you got me cold here. Well, I'll give you my name. It's Gary Harris. I'm coming from Central Road, Virginia. And um, just to look back, I haven't heard you do the discussion question. Can you give me? And I'll give you my, my, my three cents. Okay, all right. Uh, yeah, I can uh, tell me. I can't hear what you're saying. Uh, uh, yeah, we say, yeah. Jerry, Jerry, repeat what your statement or question is. Uh, I said that um, I, I didn't hear the original discussion question, but uh, give, give it to me and I'll give you my three points. Okay, well, you. Okay. Repeat the question. Okay, no problem. Yeah. This, so basically, what we're discussing is colorism better or worse in 2020. What do, what do you think? Colorism within the African American community, do you think it's better or worse? in 2020? Well, well I think, I think uh, uh, it, we are becoming uh, even more broad spectrum when, when, it, when it comes to color. Uh, there is a lot more uh, interracial marriages uh, happening now than in the past. So, 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 so therefore our views are, are, are becoming uh, even broader in, 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 in the spectrum and such. Uh, and, and uh, I think, however, our acceptance of this new uh, new wave of hues uh, is um, is uh, pretty good, and pretty pretty substantial. Uh, when we look at the broad range of actors uh, who again fall into this, this new hue range, uh, The Rock, uh, um, uh, Holly Berry, uh, Beyonce, on and on and on. You know, uh, there's, there's, there's this new range of new views, uh, which, which is why we accept it. So, so I think, uh, and, and, and if you look at TV, uh, they are really uh, uh, amplifying colorism. Uh, uh, the uh, almost every family uh, on, on TV these days uh, is, is of an interracial makeup, and and uh, their offspring and kids uh, show show that colorism. Uh, so. Um, um, uh, I, I think uh, we, 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 we're becoming, um, because of TV, because of, of, uh, of celebrity status, because of our neighborhoods are changing as well, uh, I, I don't think colorism is, 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 is as much to, today as it was in, in the past. Mm -hmm. I respect that, Jerry. Yeah, I respect that. Um, we're actually about to go up against the break, so Jerry, but thank you for that three cents. The one thing I'll say to you, just to give you, we also can challenge you anytime you call the Mental Dialogue show. So the one challenge, I will say that when you name the the, the, the actors and actresses, uh, we're, 
we're still fighting to find dark skin actors and actresses they're still fighting for their space so when we have this conversation about colorism within our own community we don't name out a lot Viola Davis she spoke to this quite often so there's the darker skin women are still fighting for their space even in Hollywood just throwing it out to you before we go to break thanks for your three cents this evening okay my pleasure I appreciate you so with that said if you want to get in like Jerry just did make sure you give us a call yeah, I'm just giving the number out there for the break. Okay. All right. Give you throw me off when you do that. Sorry. Yeah, that's a big talk. Um, um I'm sorry, excuse me. Listening to the Mr. Dialogue Facebook Live. We're about to go to break. Big Sis Media Group is a full-service design agency with tools available to help clients communicate with audiences through visual and digital media. So what exactly does that mean? You need graphic design? Call Big Sis Media. You need web design? Call Big Sis Media. You need audio or video production? Call Big Sis Media. You need a branded strategy for your business? Call Big Sis Media. Damn, they do everything, don't they? Nope, even better. They're professionals. Whatever service you need, they do a consultation, send over a contract with a deadline, and meet that deadline. A true one-stop shop for all your digital and media needs, all at an affordable price. What's their website and phone number? BigSysMediaGroup.com 404-465-4348 Again, that's BigSysMediaGroup.com Call them at 404-465-4348 Welcome back to the Mental Dialogue Facebook Live. Our first Facebook Live, I have guests with me, Shadon Reynolds, as well as Latrice Ross. I'm Montoya Smith, a.k.a. Black Socrates. This evening's discussion question, is colorism better or worse in 2020? So we've been pulling that back. We just had a caller get in. If you want to get in with us, please give us a call at 678-383-7623. And get in on this evening's discussion. Uh, we as I was just mentioning, if y'all want to give any thoughts to what Jerry had to say, I was just throwing out that when he named them, he Absolutely. still was naming what's Life pretty means. typical. Absolutely. And so, again, I don't, I don't, it's fair for him to feel like it's yeah. not different. I mean, that it's better, as he said. Right. But I was just questioning how easily and readily available he was able to name those type of Absolutely. actors. Absolutely. Because, in my opinion, if it was better, we if we really would be able to name more than a, a Viola Davis, or, you know, to if you will, go ahead. For right. sure, and I think uh, that's that's my exact point is that in order for us to feel like we're doing better, we will throw somebody in the front and say, "Look, look, look at this shiny black object that we've accepted," and that's the Beyonces of the world. Now, don't get me wrong; I love a Beyonce. I'm not hating on where she's gone to. But then I think about in that group, in my personal opinion, you little beehivers, take your little stinger somewhere else. But I <laughs> felt like Kelly was just as good of a singer, if not better. Well, but she was just her, as pretty, I'll say that. And she's definitely <laughs> beautiful. But was it acceptable because she didn't have as light of skin and the blondish color hair and all that stuff? We actually got a caller, so let's go live to the caller. Hi, yes. So I am an American native, and I just wanted to say that I am very much in agreement to this topic, okay? I am a brown skin girl myself, and I find that a lot of black girls today, they tend to, even with like the social media age, want to lie in their skin through faces and always take pictures on like Instagram and Snapchat and have the light skin filter because for whatever reason they just feel like they're prettier with the enhancement of some type of highlight even like with the makeup so I agree a lot of women today in our culture who are especially on like a higher level of entertainment it seems as though they can only make it so far as a uh, brown skin or dark skin like the Kelly Rowland as she mentioned there's this just having like a, a a beautiful light skin girl or also a brown skin girl but it always seems like the light skin girl wins and she has some type of advantage because she's black but she's at least fair skin so I definitely don't 
see that the playing field is level or equal for anybody as far as being a brown female, because even though you're black, you still have to work 10 times harder just because of the color of your skin. And I just find that completely not fair, especially in today's era. And that also goes with, like, the Crown Hair Act that had to be passed in California recently. Like, it makes no sense as to why a whole law had to be passed for our natural hair to work in the workplace. It, it, now, strong points. What's your name, Queen? What do I mean about the crown hair thing, though? No, I was... What's her name? She didn't hear it. Yeah, I was just saying, what was your name? I, I missed your name. I wanted to speak to some of what you said, but I just oh, wanted I'm to call you by your name. My name is Carla. Ca Carla? Carla. Carla. Yeah. Carla. Okay, thank you, Carla, for your thoughts. Amazing thoughts. And one thing I would... And I will get my guest's thoughts on it as well. As I was listening to you, as I was, I was mentioning this before you called to a certain extent, the idea that I'm actually more concerned with the things that you laid out I'm actually more concerned about what we within ourselves are doing in, in a sense versus when we say it's easier for, in a sense, a light-skinned woman or man to make it through Hollywood. That's still kind of a judgment of how they see us and what they let pass and things of that nature. But when you mention the idea, and this is very true, like you said, that some people will use those filters to lighten themselves up. I'm very concerned about just how we see ourselves in general. But it's almost like we're meeting to, we have, we're trying to appease it within Hollywood, but we're so caught up in it that even we're doing it ourselves. Any thoughts, Latrice? Because that sets the beauty standard. Yes. And so every woman wants to be, wants others, wants to see herself as beautiful. And so if the, the world standard is that if it's a, an exotic looking woman of color mm -hmm. and that's how beauty is measured, mm -hmm. then that's what women will go for. Um, and so that's what we see with the use of those filters is they're trying to fit into that that standardized beauty standard by looking exotic and not, you know, lightening their skin, um, reshaping their nose, those kinds of things. Now, they still keep the lips because that's acceptable by mainstream society now. now. Yeah. You know, so they want those lips. So I, I do think I, I do get disturbed by seeing the number of women who use them, particularly when you get to women my age. Mm -hmm. You know, I think it's great for women that are in their teens or early 20s, but by the time you get 30, 40, 50, you know, you, loving the skin you're in is something that I think every woman should be able to do. And so um, to play around with the bunny ears, that's one thing, but to just consistently lighten your skin and reshape Absolutely. your features, lighten your eyes, that's troublesome for me. I know with, within your organization, I almost didn't yeah, give her sure. one last thought, but I know what she prints is something that you're about when you women's empowerment is, as you all, as y'all both were saying, love the skin you're in. Absolutely. So I guess my question in reference to her bringing it up, um, Carter bringing it up, is just the idea of what, are, what type of things are you doing to, in a sense, encourage women to not do the things that we're talking about. Is that's unfortunately seems like very common uh, amongst us, because again, men, we're, we're, not, we're not filtering ourselves live. Right. Like, we're not having an issue as much. Yeah, for sure. I think for me, um, one thing I always talk about as a mom is that I believe in doing, you know, kids do what, kids do what they see, not what you say. And I think that that carries into adulthood, right? So I'm even concerned as teenagers and younger people just even introducing them to those filters because then they think that's beauty. So for me, what I focus mostly on is just being the best me that I can be outwardly proud, Say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud unapologetically and not being concerned that, oh, these people won't want to do business with me because I talk about being a proud black woman or that I'm pushing aggressively to achieve what my goals are. I no longer care that people think that me being assertive about my business is me being an angry black woman or aggressive because what I know is that we talk about a lot of stuff, but if we can't see it. If I can't see that in someone, then how do I believe that I can be it? So my sole goal is to be exactly what I know you need to see in order to change the conversation and change the narrative and not feel like, because I, I wanna be clear that we're not demonizing lighter skinned black women. I, I love all of us the same. I just want us to all love each other. Makes a lot same. of sense. Carter, still, Carter, thank you for your... Carter, still on the line? Okay, I, didn't, okay I, I was trying to get back there. Yeah, what's up? We got another comment uh, on Facebook. 
So there's another question that has been asked, and this is to the panel. It says, what are the panel's personal preferences and pressures they face in dating and love in regards to colorism, if any? It's a good question. Well, I'm married, and <laughs> the, the irony in that is um, there was definitely a time because I was a dark-skinned woman and because not just because I was a dark-skinned woman but my mother celebrated being dark-skinned since I was a little girl like I remember being excited about the summer so I can get darker because my mother is darker than I am so I always was like I'm looking for nighttime black I don't want to see him when the lights turn off <laughs> like all of these things but my husband is the complete opposite my husband but you is, ended up with but I ended up with <laughs> I ended up with happily. Uh, my husband is mixed race. Um, my children are all fair skinned children. Um, and I, I love the family that I've created. But what I celebrate in that is because I love myself so much unconditionally, I was able to find love no matter what love looked like, despite what it is I thought I wanted. You know what I'm saying? I was confident in who I was. And that's why I'm very clear to say I'm not demonizing lighter skinned women because I have a lighter skinned daughter but what I will say is some of the trauma that I kind of experienced internally was when we had our son first and when we were expecting with my daughter I wanted a chocolate baby real bad now don't get me wrong but I also had that fear of um, the fear that if she was chocolate she was darker complexion darker in complexion and my son was lighter in complexion would there be that judgment that they, they can't be brother and sister or she's not as pretty as he is because he's like so i had that fear as much as i wanted my little chocolate baby that was a reflection of me and what i love and what i look like and i didn't and i also didn't want to be such an obvious difference from my family I also did not want that for my child I didn't want her to have to experience it so it was like a sad relief when she was light because I didn't want her to have to go through that oh why don't you look like your brother oh why are, you know all, all these things but there's a the difference in the family there's a difference in how darker skinned girls are treated yes, versus darker skinned boys. Absolutely. Um, there is a dis very distinctive difference in, in yes. how they're viewed or perceived in the world. Um, I, I, as far as the question is concerned with me and color, it's, it's more the intellect that draws me, so it's never been about the mm -hmm. color of a person's skin, but the words that come out of your mouth mm -hmm. and how you use those words. Mm -hmm. um, it's been more important to me. So you ain't never had this issue then? <laughs> I got a good I story have, for you. I mean, but my husband, my ex husband was darker than me. I could be. Um, so, but I do have a chocolate grandson and I love him to death. So, here's my <laughs> answer to that question because it's, it's a full transition. Uh -huh. So, growing up in the South, I remember not only was the red bones, in a sense, the thing, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I started experiencing it. We were kind of like, I was really like the first generation that could somewhat interracial date and it wasn't a huge problem I'm from a small mm. town three stoplights oh, and, the, and the, um, the the guys before us we've seen white girls get sent away for interracial dating mm -hmm. things of this nature like that's how serious it was for them mm. and that slowed down a little bit not that we could just openly do it in my little southern town right. but we were the, kind of the first generation that didn't suffer as I mean, I'm talking about, like, even we, I grew up in a town where the KKK still marked until mm. I was in the fifth grade. Oh. So I know of guys when I was young in high school having issues with that group mm -hmm. just because they were interracial dating. Mm -hmm. We luckily didn't have to go through that, if you will. Yeah. But I still remember because light skin was good, I remember thinking white girls were better for that. I'm, talking about, I'm just mm -hmm. talking about just being mm -hmm. very sincere. Yeah, for sure. So I was the only black boy in my class. And I literally, the, the white girls in my class love me. So I literally would introduce them to my friends in my neighborhood and literally I was the one that would introduce them to the pretty white girls. Mm -hmm. Like I literally was doing that. So you was the man. Thought I was the man, right? Right. 
So the man we wanted to fight. This is, you know, <laughs> I'm just being very sincere because this is a great question. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So I mean, I don't tell the whole. I'll shorten it up. But by the time I get to high school, I was over it because this was yeah. happening for me in middle school mm. so, or whatever. And so a lot of my friends still were trying to, in a sense, date white girls or whatever. By the time I was in high school, because I had already dabbled in it as a middle schooler, I was kind of over it. Mm. Just being very honest. And I read Malcolm my eighth grade okay. year okay. and started Malcolm. learning more. Of, I, I always loved our history. I always yeah. loved our history, but I only got, when I was very young, I only got the Southern MLK right. version of history, if For you sure. will. Yeah. So when I started seeking it myself and reading Malcolm talk about the self-hate, you, mm -hmm. you can't hate the root, the tree if you hate the roots of the tree. Mm -hmm. So I'm starting, you know, in, and he became my hero. Mm. So with him becoming my hero, I'm realizing, hey, the way I saw things, was yeah, it was off. But it took me all the way to college to be like, I know love sees no color, but I got a preference. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the sisters became my preference. Yeah. So in that preference, it still was a process to go where when I would see a very dark-skinned woman that was absolutely beautiful, I remember thinking, she's unique. Mm. I'm, I'm talking about that whole, yeah. I, I, I got a whole transformation. Wow. So I go from being the first little guy in my town, I didn't say the first, but in my, my age group that mm -hmm. could date white girls, and I didn't do a whole lot of it, but I'm just right. saying, because just because of my proximity, I was the only black boy in my class, mm -hmm. or whatever. So I go from that. <laughs> yeah, 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 I mean, <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. But I'm just saying, you're growing up. And still saying that beautiful black woman, but I remember thinking when I had, when I said she was unique, I still started thinking, there's nothing prettier than her. Like I was, like that was my first transition, and, see, and I'm not I saying it's you okay. Unique. I'm, no, well, I'm admitting. I'm admitting yeah, that I it was. Yeah, I you're admitting, but yeah. I'm saying that has been a part of that experience of wow, pretty you dark black skin girl. and you pretty. Like yes. both things can't right. happen. Like it's some foreign thing. And then even when we're celebrating today, when you see there are like those really really dark women now that you see in the magazines, mm -hmm. and they like they want you to be just just as dark as this table. And it's like, if we're going to accept, accept dark skin, it has to be one extreme to the next. It's like, nothing in the middle is good enough. It's like, okay, this, if we're gonna do dark as beauty, go find me the darkest. Right. You can't you know, just be average You just dark. can't be just a regular like, African American. Like John Good said in his poem, uh, poem that the, the, even the devil be like, damn you, damn you dark as hell. <laughs> You want, they want that kind of black. Damn, right, you dark as hell. Absolutely. Like, because that's gotta be your black, it, you gotta it be. It becomes that whole exotic thing, right? Like, right. wow, you're so unique, you're foreign, you're exotic. We've never seen that aligned with beauty and grace. And, and it's like, what are you talking about? Like, I, I woke up like this every day. It's always aligned with beauty and grace. Right. But again, if, and if you're in that space, that's also very challenging because now you like I have to watch everything I say, every move I make, every statement because it's scrutinized and I have to be conscious of who I date. And so for me, I don't, I, I guess maybe because of the work I do and because I push the envelope, I take those risks. Mm -hmm. I, I, I say what's on my mind. Yep. If I'm having a moment, I express it and I refuse to be categorized as an angry black woman. Absolutely. And when I am, I ask, so what are you saying? Or do other women not get angry? Right. Because I think it's important to not allow those stereotypes to control to you. control my behavior. Absolutely. And can I can I challenge both of you just just to to, 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 to challenge y'all. No. I'm, <laughs> I'm saying I'm talking about the context <laughs> of <'cause, laughs> Because the angry black thing, to me, I'm, I'm really wanting to develop this, at least in my opinion, the conversation within ourselves. I'm talking about, whereas, for the most part, I understand it can happen to a certain, certain extent, but for the most part, the angry black woman is such a thing that can be kind of put on all of our sisters that I don't think we have that context yeah, happen as I much think, within no, ourselves. No, no, no. So I I'm think trying, that's I'm, your perception that's as okay. a man. Okay. That's so, your perception okay. as a man. That's not reality. And at the, the end of the day, the biggest debates and arguments that I have with others and the, the people who define me as aggressive and angry in most cases are black men and then black women. So it's 
it's it is definitely a thing. It's not a thing for you as a. Man. I don't think we're doing it whether based on whether you're light or black though. Why? Yes. I'm just telling you as a, yes. as a male and perspective. I don't I'm, think that's I'm why we're doing it. You I'm just throwing out. I'm just throwing out. I think that consciously it does happen. Absolutely, based on color. For sure. Yeah. You, yeah, I'm just seeing what you think. I just wonder. Just wonder. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. I mean, I understand what the sisters are saying as a man because I do agree with you. I, I don't think that we as and you know, Montoya, you know me. I I like to use this term. We as mature black men do a little bit less limiting or of that that specifics and saying, "Oh, you're just an angry black woman because you're darker than this sister," and she has that. I think it is with with mature men. It is we we try to look at it from the sense, no, nah, you know, because there are some, and, and I and I'm I'm not gonna say this. Sometimes there, there is a difference between being aggressive slash angry slash assertive because I love a confident woman mm -hmm. I'm like I, I need a woman that can be like because I know I can get bullheaded Roy stop you need to pay attention to what you're doing you know so it, there's not a problem I don't think mature men have a problem with aggressive women it's when you aggressive and rude that's the thing I was trying to get at let me, let me, let me, say, this so, real, let me say this real quick so when I was talking about like that transition of where I got to loving all hues, and I still I love dark women like that. I I, go, I went from the young man I told you I was mm -hmm. to now where I absolutely love. I mean I was date any I want a black woman, but as long as she's in any of those flavors, if you will, right? So what I was shit, what I, my pushback is this: I think what y'all are experiencing are men that are more on the transition of how we love and appreciate or don't. As black women, so no, 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 I'm trying to give y'all. I'm trying to give you a male perspective. I'm saying the male. Sometimes I'm just again. I get what you're saying. Let me at least let me finish. At least let me finish. Trying to give us the perspective that I think what you're thinking that white people are doing to black people. No, this is not this. No, this is opposite. You're not right now. I'm telling you, as men, I'm giving you our perspective as men. So this is not your perspective as a man. Right. So what I'm sharing with you again, I'm not, it's not about whether I'm right. I'm just asking you to hear. We hear you. That I'm just telling you that when y'all are hearing black men call you angry, and I'm not saying they don't. They absolutely do it. I get tired of them too. Like you said, mature men versus immature. I'll just ask put, if you put your headphones back on. So Roy, all I'm simply saying is when he says the immature men, I'm just telling you that I think they're more transitioning out of their full appreciation or lack of appreciation for black women in general. So while you're having black men say that you're angry or accuse you of that, and I know that it happens, I'm just telling you what I find amongst, if we go amongst men, I used to, have to when I was in college, I used to check men who would talk bad about black women and would date any kind of white woman. We'd be like, like you, I'm talking about any, I mean, I'm just, this is kind of what it is, like a big fat ugly woman that's who we will be with and have nothing but shit to talk about black women. So I'm giving that example to those that are men that are calling you angry have still have their own inner issues with black women that has nothing to do with colorism. I don't think. So let me challenge you okay, right. from a diversity and inclusion perspective and go back to unconscious bias. Mm -hmm. I think many of those men react unconsciously yes. in those situations without mm -hmm. thinking that they are they are reacting that way. Yes. So I think that we're missing that. A lot of times people react because our brain is thinking for us and mm -hmm. we react quicker than the brain reacts for us quicker than we can control that reaction. And so while yes, when you're being consciously aware of that, perhaps not, but in those instances where there is an emotional conversation going on or someone's being passionate about a particular topic or mm -hmm. something of that nature, I honestly believe that unconscious bias kicks in for and sure. you have those expressions of angry black woman coming from mature men, but it's coming from that unconscious bias. Well, you can say I, what I'm saying, an angry black woman based on your hue. That's the part yeah. of it. No, but that's yeah, what I'm saying. Because you say angry black woman, I don't know if you're weird. more visceral okay, towards correct. a darker skinned woman Absolutely. versus Let, a lighter skinned woman. So I want to, since we were in this part of the conversation as well, I, I want to ask a question to the two sisters, especially based on what you just said. <laughs> Are there, no, I, I am. Do you think that there are times, and not even just times, but there are some women who literally are just angry black women, though. But 
But you gotta. No, 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 hold on. So, no, I'm gonna do this. You, I don't want to. I don't want to. That's a whole different topic. Okay, well, I won't get into it. That's a whole. That's I, a whole, I, that's I whole, do want to read the comment that somebody made yeah, yeah, from one of the guests there. So that's a whole. We'll have that discussion offline. I'll answer that question. Here's one of the comments that actually I think kind of goes into what what you all are saying. Darkness in black men equates masculinity, and darkness in black women equates masculinity. Mm. Aggressive is considered a masculine trait. Okay. It okay. doesn't help that many black women are forced to take on the roles that often that are often occupied by absentee fathers and father figures. That is again Walter Vinson who made that comment. Walter is my boo. Let me start he off is. by saying that. Okay, because I'm trying to get. I'm, I'm like he don't want to call in. I'm like that's the, that is so true and it's so well put i'm so grateful for that comment because it is it is associated with masculinity when you think about like light-skinned guys there is this perception that light-skinned men are soft and you can push them over and all that stuff and i think that then carries into light-skinned women you think that they're more likely to be submissive which is a whole other conversation um but they're more likely to be subservient and calm and relaxed and so if even if they express themselves, you're like, oh, let me listen because she's really passionate about that thought. You know? What was done to wrong her? Let's make right, it right. Let's make it right. But it's like, there she go again. She always got an attitude and, when that, it's the dark skin. What girl. Walter said comes from a sense of unconscious bias. Yes. When a woman perceives that when a person perceives a black, a darker skinned black man as being mm-hmm. more masculine, that's the brain thinking for her. So yes. that that also goes forward when it comes to darker skinned black women. No, sure. I stand corrected. I feel, I mean, I'm good that's, on that. That's really good. So, thank you, oh, Okay, cool, cool. So, if you want to get in, 678 383 7623, please give us a call. And so, I was still kind of in a sense breaking down my little story and that transition. And in, in stating that story and that transition, I think it is in order for colorism to improve, if, if we're still saying it's, it's evolved. So I don't know if that's saying we're saying it's still similar. I think I'm seeing some forward, forwardness on this in the sense of how we're coming to love the skin we're in. Um, but the issues we've had is just owning how much we've accepted someone else's standard of beauty. Absolutely. Like, like just really breaking down that yeah. that is the full process for why colorism is a problem within our own yeah, community. Yeah, and that's for sure. And it's like we're not, we're not dismissing that. But what I'm saying, for me in particular, I think one of the issues that is easy for us to gloss over is that everybody wants to tell black women how to see things and how to feel and how to perceive stuff. I'm saying it's about black people. Yeah, I'm talking about about black people. You told us don't interrupt you now. So what I'm saying here is that just like what you were saying and what this gentleman is saying, it's like, well, no, that's not true because mature black men are doing this and mature black men are doing that. And here you have a dark-skinned woman saying that is what your your intentions may be, but here's how it's coming off and here's how we're receiving it. And she's explaining to you that that is a, a unconscious bias that you may have for me, my experience is still black men trying to tell black women how, oh, you're reading that wrong, that's not, and it may not be your intentions, but if someone feels a certain kind of way, then somebody needs to step up and say, okay, I'm making you feel that way, let me do something different versus pushing it back out into the to the earth and say, oh, no, it's all the white people again that's gotten us thinking Yeah, I don't think, I, I, I got to be honest with you, oh, we got to go to break. Right? Well, no, I wanted to, I wanted to say something to that because... Yeah, I, I just mean, want to say, I don't think you heard what I just said, because I, I put this, I would say my experience in talking about us as black people having the standard of beauty for us as black people was being that. So I wasn't even addressing yeah. what you just talked about. I was addressing that us as black people, I, 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 just wanted to, I was wanting to move the conversation, and if we're going to improve colorism, not about black women, I'm saying as black people, we have to deal with the idea that we have the, that we as a community have um, white as a standard. That was my own story. So I was I just get, telling my own story. I wasn't, saying, I wasn't saying talking about that anymore. Right, it's not about you specifically, though. My point is that we have to understand, or let's, let me speak as an individual. As an individual, African-American woman, dark complexion, my experience 
has been more than not of men assuming that I am aggressive when I'm just being passionate, that, you know, oh, having that standoff, being afraid to approach me or say certain things to me because there's this perception. And what I'm saying is that just hear us when we say this is how we feel, this is how it comes off versus saying, I hear you, but... Because to me, but means, and nobody's talking about you specifically, Montoya. Stop, don't be so quick to defend and just hear it. So is my point. So let me let me ask, uh, and I, I guess actually make a comment about that because that's also the flip side of that. Because the the point when I think at least what I would, and so like I said, I won't I won't speak for Montoya at this point. I'll speak for what what when when I'm looking at that situation and asking the question. I'm not coming off it. Like you said, just how you just like you receive certain something a certain way, mm -hmm. that doesn't necessarily mean that that was my intention, correct? Or that that was how I was even thinking of that process. So I know, and it's interesting because this reminded me of a conversation that my Tony and I had a few weeks ago about the thing is, is that we've got to get to a point, and this is always he knows this is my thing about communicating. Mm -hmm. We've got to get to a point where we communicate, not to respond, but to understand each yes. other. And so, like, even with the question that I was asking, it wasn't a question of saying that, you know, it, it, it's like me saying to you, there are no black men out there who are making colorism an issue for you. That, I, that, that would be the most asinine comment for me to ever make. For sure. <clears throat> Excuse me. In my entire, you know, in the whole system of what we were doing. But at the same time, just like you've experienced people coming off to you that way, I've experienced sisters and look i'm talking to rainbow <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not talking about just dark skinned sisters from butter pecan tan to, to dark chocolate who are angry and they come at me because of something that they perceived as situations that they've had with other men so like i said that that was and that was the whole point of me asking the question I and you you, you commented it response. is it, it, it absolutely it's is specific to color so no, I no, it's that's it's one not. Of the pieces that we should be having the conversation of right. and using that verbiage, right? right? Um, because they are associated with the two. Now, I, I I wasn't offended by your question at all. So let me start okay. off by saying that. Oh, no, no, I didn't or was I offended by his comment? My 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 point is that okay. if when you speak your piece and we say, "Great, I hear what you're saying, King. I hear that." Let me tell you what my experience is, right? Here's my experience, and it would be helpful to me if you would do X, Y, Z. That's a part of what you just said. Don't just listen to respond. Listen to hear what I'm saying. And I'm hearing what you're saying. But I'm, you're giving me feedback to say, but listen, this is my experience, and I received that. And then in turn, I'm saying, but also I want you to take this in consideration, and we both have something to take away versus the oh well you're not hearing what i'm saying like that that's not what the point is here it is for us to be able to have this open dialogue and if we're specifically in that conversation speaking about the experience of a dark-skinned woman when a dark-skinned woman is telling you what her experience is with that unconscious bias be mindful of your words because then it starts to sound like you're telling us that no, it's not happening the way you think that is happening. Or you put this cap on it to say, oh, it's only uh, immature black men, because then that's a spectrum. Like who, who decides who's mature and who's immature and how that's defined and regardless is happening. Because the kids at the high school and the middle schools and all that stuff, these are kids that are not mature. So we need to fix it so that it's not happening because who you are as a boy, you just grow into that as a man to some degree. In my All opinion. right. Thank you. So now we're going to go to a break. We'll be right back. You're listening to Mental Dialogue Facebook Live. All my life, been grinding all my life. Sacrifice. Hustle pay the price, wanna slice, got to roll the dice, that's why all my life, I've been grinding all my life, look, all my life, been grinding all my life, sacrifice, hustle pay the price, wanna slice, got to roll the dice, that's why all my life, I've been grinding all my life. Are you motivated? Better yet, are you motivated to act? Don't chase the bag, attract the bag. It's the Money Motivation Podcast. 
an unscripted view into the game of money, assets, dividends, forex, trust funds, commodities, futures, the Money Motivation Podcast. <laughs> Welcome back to the Facebook Live Mental Dialogue. I'm your host, Montoya Smith, a.k.a. Black Socrates, with a special guest, Shadon Reynolds, as well as Latrice Ross. We are discussing, is colorism better or worse? If you want to get in on tonight's discussion, please give us a call at 678 678- Three eight three seven six two three. Is it better or worse in 2019? I think we 2020. 20, I'm sorry, 2020. I'm sorry, I'm so thrown off. I said the wrong year. I apologize, y'all. Um, but with that said, um, in this discussion, again, if we're saying, I think you said earlier that it's evolved. Is that fair? That we've just evolved, not that it was necessarily bad. No, I'm talking about I in think, the very beginning of the. No, I didn't okay. say that we've evolved. After, like, we've just tolerated. We've learned to tolerate it. Okay, gotcha. Okay, yeah. so we tolerated it. So yeah, tolerated it. Um, in your, in, for you, was it better or worse at this point, in your opinion, in 2020? I, I, to be in all honesty, I think it's worse simply because of the communication mechanisms that we have now in place that we didn't have in the past. We now have Instagram and Twitter and Facebook and Snapchat and all these means of insulting people globally, mm. whereas before you could only insult locally. Yeah. So I think that because of the, the communication methods that we have, it's actually worse as a result. Yeah, that's scary to me. Um, I remember I've talked about this on the, the regular show from time to time. It's probably been over a decade ago, but if you remember, for example, the Board of Education, one of the key things they used in the 1956 Board of Education versus Topeka when they, when they integrated the schools, one of the key things that they talked about during that case was the doll test that was used. Again, it was just kind of brought in as a separate thing and how a lot of the African-American kids were picking white over black, right? And so almost a decade ago, somebody revisited that test just to kind of see Mm-hmm. And the results were improved, but not by much. Mm-hmm. And so I've never forgot seeing that study because it let me know how early the things that we're talking about right now, how early it is seeping into our children. Mm-hmm. And so, like, I think people can give their individual experiences of how they were experiencing it, but the idea of how we get past it is to own how soon that standard of beauty is being shown to our children. I I agree with you, and so one of the examples I have is when my grandson was born, we were at at IHOP with him, and he was still in the little carrier, and the waitress walks up and says, oh, he's he's a cute little chocolate baby. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, my response was, so would he be cute if he were lighter? And she was a little flustered about that. But as a grandmother, I don't want, you know, I'm very protective of mm-hmm. my. And so when she said that, I, I became that protective mode kicked in. And he's, he's cute regardless of what his skin tone is because he's my grandchild. And I had to put her, I had to let her know that I didn't find that to be a compliment. compliment. Or if it was a compliment, it was a black, it was a backhanded compliment. Yeah. And I didn't like it. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things that we have to start doing is when someone says, oh, you're, you're, Oh, she's so cute for a little black girl or a dark skinned girl. Yeah. Correct them. Let them know that she's cute for a girl. Or, you she's know, just cute. She's just cute. Absolutely. And I think that to that point, uh, what you're saying is that you try to adjust or redirect the conversation, fix the problem at the root, at the start of it, but then that becomes, oh, well, she's so aggressive. I was just trying to give her a compliment. And, you know, and then and so we end up back in this circle, this cycle of I'm just trying to correct you to say that this is not okay to define beauty in this way and you're saying and you're perceiving me as being aggressive or angry when that's not the point. And see, I, I, I honestly, and I honestly don't buy into that. So I, you know, yeah. how she perceived me to be, it didn't really Did matter because I probably was aggressive because mm-hmm. she was talking about my grandchild. Okay. Um, but I wanted her to understand, and to your point, we began to perpetuate those values about our self-worth and our beauty Perfect. at that young age when we, have, when we have people walk up and they tell our children at three, four, five, and six, they're cute for a dark-skinned girl, and so, or they're cute for a dark-skinned boy. We need to correct that. No, my child is cute, period. Yeah. I don't need the 
other adjectives to describe what makes him cute. Patrice, actually to that, to that, I have a question to that. Um, and this is, again, you know, you made, a, you made a great point. The fact that we have, we have so many ways to communicate in today's society and our communication skills have gotten worse in, in all of those things. So let's go back to the, to the point of the young lady that you were just talking about. Because when, when I'm listening to it, I'm trying to re recognize if I'm hearing two different things. And, and that's what I wanted to ask you. Okay. So what I thought, because I, I get what you're saying about being upset about it. If she would have said, oh, he's cute for a, did, did she say he's cute for a chocolate baby? Or did, he say, did she say, oh, he's a cute little chocolate baby? She said he was cute for a little chocolate. She said he's, cute, he's a cute little chocolate baby. Okay. So and and so here's the question. I think he knows where. Yeah, know this where is like for me, that, and, and like you said, how you perceive it, we get it. And and I would have, I probably would have been like, well, you know, my apologies. I didn't mean that in a negative way. But chocolate was more of a descriptor. It's it is an adjective, is not about and not saying that he wouldn't be cute for anything. But like, I mean, like me, I I you know, I like chocolate. You know, I. But why was it necessary? Right. Well, but it, 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 what adjective is necessary? So when, but see, so we can say we can easily say when someone says that oh, she's cute for it. So what's the difference? Well, no, see, that's that's Chocolate the difference. That's the difference. Dark skin. Hear, hear, hear what you said though. There is a difference for saying he's cute for a, or that's a cute. And it, 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 it's it's so, and again, it's again, this is a male man. Maybe it's a men's mentality. No. So let me explain. So if he says it's a cute dark skin baby versus a cute chocolate baby, it's still the same thing. That descriptor isn't necessary. When I see a child, I say, oh, what a cute baby that is. Well, and, and like I said, that's why I said it, it could just be the male thing because, yes, the descri descriptors are used. We, we use different descriptors, doesn't but it doesn't necessarily in the mean. Black community, community, in the black community, you don't, you should, if we want right. to begin to stop the colorism, the colorism we issue. have to begin to stop right. using, allowing those descriptors yes. to be used with our children present towards our children because what that says to them, I'm only cute. I'm, I'm cute, but would I be if I if, if you know if you wasn't But I think I think that, that goes to the sister um Shadon. Just I, and, and this is what I say. Think about what you said about your mother. Your mother celebrated right. your darkness right. your entire life. Right. That's all you ever known. So let me ask you this. When you heard a brother, now again, because believe me, I do think there is a difference in saying okay. she is cute for a dark-skinned girl mm -hmm. or as opposed to me saying, well, that's a gorgeous chocolate sister right there. So, so what, it's different, so, but the connotation and the, the, the message that it sends is the same. Mm -hmm. so, so that's Well, that's what I was going to ask you. Would you look at those as being the same thing? So I think the, the difference is who's delivering the message and how the, the message is being delivered. I think all of those play a role. So for me, it was my mother. And I think my mother understood because of what she went through as a dark skinned girl that when I went out into the world, that I would experience these things of people trying to define what beauty is and saying that what I was was not that. Or if I was beautiful, that it had to be defined as you're beautiful in this space of dark skinned women. Um, so I think that's different. I think that was her responsibility as a mother mm -hmm. to make sure to remind me of how beautiful it is to be a woman of color. And so we've right. all heard the, you know, black and berry, the sweet of the juice, all these good things, right. right? But I think that was her responsibility as my mother. Somebody who did not know me in a public situation I don't think that was appropriate because what I hear her saying is that, or for me, my takeaway is that if it was any other race of baby, like would you say to an Asian baby, oh, look at that cute little yellow baby. You know what I'm saying? Like we don't have those, we don't well, use those descriptors outside so, of bl the black community. Right. I, but I wanted to show the flip side of that also. My friend has a daughter who's darker than the rest of her children and she won't date a black man because she doesn't want dark skinned babies. Because as a little girl, she was always told she was a pretty little chocolate girl. And that stuck with her. So now as a 20 something year old woman, she won't date a black man. But that so, goes to her mother. Those, those are her so, parents. So let me, yeah, let me ask her. Her parent didn't so, say that. So others around her. Right. But did they reinforce like her parents? Right. So yeah, let me ask, yeah, let, yeah, let me ask this because 
breaking down this white standard that we now know see is it's not just what we're saying it's also imaging for why these babies yeah. they're babies picking on or you know i think they do it for like four and under when they do these little yeah these, these were mm -hmm. so they're pretty nobody young. over the second yeah, grade. yeah so they're pretty young so I, so it's a combination of what they're hearing and definitely what they're seeing right mm -hmm. and so i'm blown away by this example because I would actually see our different hues as something that we could celebrate that has right. never been celebrated. The reason, we, in my opinion, yeah, look at the, the reason we have a colorism issue is because it was closer to white. So we put one on a pedestal. The, the best thing to me about sisters is the fact that since I say I want to end up with just a sister, mm -hmm. I got way more choices <laughs> than every other culture do. And I love the fact that we quote unquote, I'm, now this is offensive. You have to teach me, but I'm just saying that I don't know that we ever grew up celebrating a chocolate baby in the past. We didn't do that. It was it was bad to be dark skinned. So I'm just saying intent. I would hope intent still would matter. Well, what, what Go ahead. Intent still matters. It does. But but what she's saying, what I'm hearing, and what I believe is that just celebrate the baby for being a cute baby. Period. It doesn't. You don't have to describe it as a chocolate baby. When we were younger, I remember I had all type of experiences because my children were really, really fair skinned, and so I, I had an older black woman ask were my you the husband nanny? who I was <laughs> asked if I was the nanny. And to that point, that's yeah. another thing that my people say to me, and they think it's funny. Yeah. And that's hell of offensive when yeah. you have exactly. carried a child. For nine months, the closest thing to death is right. delivering a kid. And for somebody to jokingly say, you must be the nanny. That can't be your right. baby. Looking right. at you, right. looking at the baby, looking at you, looking at the baby, looking at right. you. Yeah, they but, get cussed out. Yeah, but you but it's more black people doing that. And, but even, wow. So just to go back to his point, though, about um, saying that and seeing it as celebrated, we would hope that it would be a celebration. But how is it received by that child? Correct. And so that's what, if we want to stop perpetuating this colorism, mm -hmm. that's going to be one of those things that we have to stop altogether and then get accustomed to that and then begin to celebrate that. Because if that child keeps hearing, you're, you're a pretty chocolate girl or a pretty chocolate boy, then they become defined by that color. And then if they have other siblings who are not that color, right. then there is an issue there as and well. And I think it's easier for us to receive when we remove color from it. Like, I think that if we were to say, just say that somebody has pretty hair, you doesn't, you don't have to say, oh, that's some, you know, you got some a ninth grade of kinky hair or something like that. You would just say, oh, your hair is really pretty. Or, oh, that's a pretty outfit. Or that's a pretty whatever. You don't say, oh, that's a pretty brown shirt you got on. No, it's just a pretty shirt. It's just a pretty hairstyle. It's just whatever that item is. You just define it as either something you like or you don't like. But when we incorporate race, somehow now you feel like you have to be extremely specific to what it is that you're celebrating in this person. And all I'm saying is that like my children are beautiful because they're beautiful, not because they're light skinned. I remember us being in Sam's Club and this white guy going up to my mom and said, oh, it's your grandchild, so baby, yeah, I got a biracial child uh, grandbaby too. Well, my baby ain't biracial. You know, like you just assuming and you want to insert that and he was doing that, I'm sure, thinking he's just trying to relate. Right. But don't make that assumption. Just, you don't, it, it's unnecessary. To dis describe to that much detail. My stylist had a teenage well, yeah, apprentice. Let's go to a break. Okay. Come out of a break. Uh, we're going to do a quick break. We'll come back with Latrice's thoughts after the break. If you want to get in, 678-383-7623. Please give us a call. We'll be right back with the Mental Dialogue Facebook Live. Big Sis Media Group is a full-service design agency with tools available to help clients communicate with audiences through visual and digital media. So what exactly does that mean? You need graphic design? Call Big Sis Media. You need web design? Call Big Sis Media. You need audio or video production? Call Big Sis Media. You need a branded strategy for your business? Call Big Sis Media. Damn, they do everything, don't they? Nope, even better. 
They're professionals. Whatever service you need, they do a consultation, send over a contract with a deadline, and meet that deadline. A true one-stop shop for all your digital and media needs, all at an affordable price. What's their website and phone number? BigSisMediaGroup.com 404-465-4348 Again, that's BigSisMediaGroup.com Call them at 404 404- Four six five four three four eight. Welcome back to the Mental Dialogue Facebook Live. I'm your host, Montoya Smith, aka Black Socrates. This evening's discussion question is colorism better or worse in 2020? A special guest, Shadon Reynolds, as well as Latrice Ross. Latrice, you will give us some thoughts before the break. Go ahead with the question. I was going to say how how we see it coming up in the next generation. My hairstylist had an apprentice helping her. She was in a high school hairstyling program or whatever you call it. And when she began to wash my hair, it curled up and she wanted to know what I was mixed with. Mm. And this was from a 17 year old. Yeah. And so we see how that is continuing. It's, my hair can only be that way because I'm mixed and I'm not. Yeah. That's such a good point because when, we, he, when you mentioned earlier that you don't hear people call it red bones anymore. But now the conversation is, what are you mixed with? It's automatically assumed that if you have certain complexion, you must be mixed with something. There's no way that you have these pretty eyes or this good hair, your hair curled all that. You have to, there's no way just pure black made that. And that is, I think, the replacement of uh, red bone and you know all these things it's like well where are you from and yeah I, i'll say even even past that just something i've been thinking about even when i said it earlier um and i'm glad you know since hip-hop is slightly moved, i think they've moved past this one little term but again i know i keep pushing it back to our standard unfortunately has been whiteness you know what i mean that's just been our standard for what look what looked good what didn't and because of that standard, I just want us to wake up to the uh, to the fact that we're still playing to that more than we realize. Even in everything that y'all are talking about, you must be mixed with something. But even hip hop went through this period. I, I tested it. There was when 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 I was younger and growing up with hip hop. When we talked about foreign, you were talking about a foreign car. But there was a small period where you don't hear it as much right now, which is good. But there was a small period where you started hearing the rappers talk about foreign. And it was like, I got me a farm, and it was someone, a farm, someone exotic, other than a black woman. Mm -hmm. Like, it was clear, you know what I mean? So we wasn't in right. that, and that was a, that was a, that meant you was more, um, you know what I mean? You got more props for yeah. chasing a farm. And so for me, that was aggravating because it was like, we still don't see the beauty in our own. But I still, I think that, uh, again, I think we should celebrate everything. But I do feel like we get in this space where we like to jump on a bandwagon. And when I say we, for me, my experience is that with black men, um, they want to celebrate something other than just the average, or you know, for lack of a better term, like the average black woman. So like even now you're dealing with, uh, is it uh, vertigo where the skin tone? Vitiligo. Vitiligo. Vitiligo, thank you. Um, but it's like, oh, now that's exciting. You know what I'm saying? Like, so people want to celebrate that and see that. But it's, we keep jumping over just regular dark skin girls. Hey, we got a caller. Get, tell us your name, where you're calling from, and give us your three cents on this evening's discussion question. You're live on the air. Okay, can you hear me? Who's the voice of my speaker? So she has, Hello? You have it in the background. Yeah, you have to turn it off in the background in order for us to hear you live on the air. Uh, yep, turn it off okay. in the background. Let me, so let me try to move. Hold on. All right, we got it. All right, what's your name, where you're calling from, and your three cents on this evening's discussion? Did we lose it? I think she muted her phone instead of using her computer. Right. Ah. All right, we'll, you know. Oh, she hung up. Oh, she hung up. Okay. All right. We lost the caller. Call back in. 678-383-7623. Make sure you do not have the broadcast in the background. We won't be able to hear you. Um, but, look, go ahead. But just that, you know, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's... it's no, I know exactly what you're like, saying. So, like you said, the foreign piece is like, okay, well, if I'm going to do a dark-skinned woman, let me get, you know, someone from... 
an island or you know like there's it's just like the regular African American woman is still not good enough so to speak I, I wanted to bring something up because I think everybody's touching on it but you actually got deeper into the direct point Montoya a little while ago the reality that we have to realize like I'll be 50 this year the standard of beauty has been a European standard of beauty our entire lifetime for what we've seen on television. And so those images, you know, we, we, if you think about it, if you grew up in the 70s, in the 80s, you know, who were the beautiful women? Pam Greer, the Huxtable, you know, and nothing wrong with these sisters for being the complexion that they are. But that's what was always considered beautiful. And so we've been, we've been indoctrinated, we've been programmed, to have that mentality, and that's where you talk about, um, Latrice, the, the subconscious thing coming in. Mm -hmm. That is one of the reasons that having control of our own media is such an important piece to us being able to move forward and change these. Because we've got to have, and like, like you said at the beginning of the, um, the, the show, Shadon, how do you have to, I, when I saw it, I was pissed. Why do you have to make a law for my hair to grow naturally mm -hmm. out of my head? I'm like, you're telling me that what I naturally do is wrong yeah. just by having to create the law. And it's, it's like, you know, we're not looking at it. We're looking at things in a different perspective. And we, we have to change the imagery of our people. Absolutely. Let me, let me say something about, like I like say, even going back to what you just said, just how I hear that. See, even being upset about that law, is, is some, is some, and we're mad about it, it's like we're still defaulting to them when that's what we're mad about and, and I'm talking about to the extent that we're not owning where we're at with this issue like I'm talking about just owning where we're at the fact that we are doing this amongst ourselves like I'm saying to the extent that foundationally and I think we're moving I, I hope this is getting better because I think I feel like I do see this getting better just the way that we're celebrating ourselves is getting getting better but not better to the extent that we're not still doing these things to one another just within ourselves. I'm talking about what they do aside, just completely yeah. aside. I'm just talking about just within ourselves to the extent that, that it, even given my example of what my transition was, when these fads come along or excited come along, that is, maybe this is still a topic because why is it still happening? You understand what I'm saying? That these things, for the foreign t t thing to come along and now the bit of like, but anything, like I say, anything but our sisters or anything but, as you want, as you said, the average black woman, anything but, well, that's, we're, we, we have, we and ourselves have not done enough for the next new thing to keep coming along. You, 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 I get what you're saying, yeah. but I think, so that still plays back to her point when she's saying stop just a part of that is don't describe the beauty of this child by the tone. You know that it's a chocolate baby. What we're saying is stop doing that because that's a part of it. If you were simply just constantly telling this child how amazingly beautiful they were or how smart they are and all these things constantly, then the outside world won't be able to tell them anything because they will believe that wholeheartedly. And what I'm I think it's like you said unconsciously we're we're still playing into that and we think that we're doing it in love but we're saying that's 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 not what the outcome is even if that was your intention because you have reminded that child that you are that despite being chocolate or dark skin yeah, I, yeah, I haven't made a. Oh, yeah, I'm not definitely not saying to not do that. I was just saying that there's other there's other things in addition to that when we know they're reaching at that, you know, reaching at that early, like the media stuff, um, ensuring that we're getting them books and things of that nature. That we have to do that, and that's still not getting done enough. I think that this next generation of babies that are growing up will mm -hmm. have a different experience. Yes, so. because you have more books being published that celebrate just being a black child. Yes. You have more parents who are now culturally more culturally aware of mm -hmm. their African roots and they're they're incorporating that into the way that they raise Absolutely. their children. So the way that you and I were raised right. was completely different. Uh, my mother actually raised me to not be 
ghetto, to not be loud, to not behave certain ways because I wouldn't be accepted by mainstream society. I mean, that's how my mother raised me. And so we are seeing people now that are unapologetically black. And I think that if this group of people, is this generation of young men and women have children and they raise them to be unapologetically black, regardless of the hue of their skin, then you're going to get a different you're going you're gonna to start seeing different um, outcomes when it comes to colorism and yeah. things of that nature because you're just African of African descent, if you will, and your color doesn't matter because right. you weren't raised to be a handsome chocolate boy or a pretty chocolate girl. You were just raised to be a pretty girl of African descent or a pretty boy of African descent, and none of, that other, none of those other descriptors matter, and I think yeah. that we'll see a difference in the next generation right. beyond. I think yeah. part of that too. Yeah, I'm sorry. We, are, we almost at the end, so I was just going to oh, wrap it no, up. No, I was going to say, yeah. uh, what I also, as being a mom of that mm-hmm. next generation, mm-hmm. is that okay. um, the, the other piece that I think we, we don't put as much attention just into that physical piece, period. Like, when my conversation with my children is, I'm constantly, the last thing I tell my daughter is that she's pretty. But my first conversation is, you are so smart, you are brilliant, you're going to be an entrepreneur, you're going to take over the business, you know, and then you're beautiful, you're a queen, you know, all these things, and then I tell her that she's beautiful. That's not even, beauty or looks are not even top on the list in the conversation. And I see that amongst my friends, that we're not even focused on appearance to that extent. We're just like, you're super dope, you're great, period. All right, we are up against another break. We'll be right back. You're listening to the Mental Dialogue Facebook Live. we got 30 minutes more for you. So if you want to get in, you can get in at 678-383-7623. We'll be right back. All I ask is that you think. All my life, been grinding all my life. Sacrifice. Hustle paid the price, want a slice, got to roll the dice, that's why All my life, I been grinding all my life, look All my life, been grinding all my life Sacrifice, hustle paid the price, want a slice Got to roll the dice, that's why All my life, I been grinding all my life Are you motivated? Better yet, are you motivated to act? Don't chase the bag, attract the bag It's the Money Motivation Podcast An unscripted view into the game of money Assets, dividends, forex, trust funds, commodities, futures The Money Motivation Podcast Big Sis Media Group is a full-service design agency with tools available to help clients communicate with audiences through visual and digital media. So what exactly does that mean? You need graphic design? Call Big Sis Media. You need web design? Call Big Sis Media. You need audio or video production? Call Big Sis Media. You need a branded strategy for your business? Call Big Sis Media. Damn, they do everything, don't they? Nope, even better. They're professionals. Whatever service you need, they do a consultation, send over a contract with a deadline, and meet that deadline. A true one-stop shop for all your digital and media needs, all at an affordable price. What's their website and phone number? BigSysMediaGroup.com 404-465-4348 Again, that's BigSysMediaGroup.com Call them at 404-465-4348 Welcome back to the Mental Dialogue Facebook Live. I'm your host, Montoya Smith, a.k.a. Black Socrates, special guest to Don Reynolds, as well as Latrice Ross. Thank all of you for tuning in to our first Facebook Live, trying to give y'all something to do on this Friday as everybody has a little cabin fever, I I feel, uh, from everything that's going on. But we've been having a lively discussion on is colorism better or worse in 2019? 2020. I keep saying 2019. (laughs) I'm going to tell you, I'm going to go ahead and just call myself out. We did this show last year, and I'm still saying it. Uh, Because all all the shows, options that everybody had, if you didn't get a chance to vote, It came from shows that you can listen to every Saturday. So speaking of, tomorrow morning, let me throw that out real quick. Um, 10 a.m. to 12 p.m., first hour, um, Maryland, 
uh, Odu Eni is coming on for all of you who have your children at home and need some tips on homeschooling. Mm -hmm. She is a unschool and homeschool expert, so we'll have her on the first hour. The second hour will be open call. So that's on Blog Talk. You can go to my Facebook page. If you're on Facebook, we'll also be playing it live there. So tune in for that tomorrow morning. But back to this evening's discussion. We're going to just do one more segment for all those out there listening. If you want to get some comments in, if you want to read some of the comments as well, please do that. We'll get some of the comments uh, from those on Facebook. If you want to get in on the phone call, you got 15 minutes left, 678-383-7623 to get on the call. But is it better or worse in 2019? All of these sound like great advice for how to improve it. Um, I'll tell you, as you say, I think it'll be better for the next generation than someone who works in an after-school program and actually work at an international school. And I will tell you that I'm still saddened by some of the things I see at the international school when it comes to our youth, mm -hmm. specifically our African-American youth. Now, this school is a mix of all kind of different you know, mm -hmm. they, they study maybe four to five different languages. Um, and so it's pretty cool to see our kids speaking all these different languages, right? Um, but I will tell you, as a, in the after school program, I, it still hurts me when I see, not, and it is getting better, but I still hurts me when I see, for example, our black boys, our black girls, when they're coloring, that they're still coloring white kids. Not, I definitely see some don't, but I hate that still, the, it's rarer to see them yeah. color themselves. Yeah. I remember years ago, before I was at this particular school, before I even got to the international school, I remember, and I, I still, literally still have this picture up with one of my um, students gave me, and it was an Indian girl. Mm -hmm. She had, you know, whatever, you know, they give you stuff because they like you or whatever. So she gives me a picture, and the fact that it was brown skin, was eye open to me because mm -hmm. I'm sitting here going her at this at this young age she understands that she's brown skinned and I just remember mm -hmm. thinking about the other kids who who are black who didn't see themselves she shit that's how she, that's the only way she knew to cover herself mm -hmm. and I'm sitting here going my, my, some of my own black children yeah. like again that's how early the things that turn into the things that we've been talking about earlier. It, it starts so early, and it's just really, unfortunately, black is seen as a bad thing. Yeah. It's just the fact that black is bad mm -hmm. is how we end up doing colorism in our own community. Outside the states, and I want to hear y'all thoughts on this, I guess it's even worse, unfortunately, in places outside of the United States. For sure. So all our examples have been our own and our own mm -hmm. relative circle. What I did this show, I remember paying, playing cuts for something that still happens pretty bad in Brazil, where where they are they literally are encouraging their girls and their boys, especially the girls. Again, it's harder for y'all than it is for men when it comes to colorism, but encouraging them to marry out in order to get the black out over generations. Like this is still a very real thing in Brazil and some other countries in South America, mm -hmm. but specifically in Brazil, they literally still encourage, not, maybe not all, I don't never want to yeah. put all on anybody, right? right? But it is still a big part of the culture to marry out. And I remember on that cut, the, 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 the darker sisters there were saying how they were trying to get away from that themselves, mm -hmm. but how much heartache it has brought them because the older generation is still pushing marry out uh, right. to lighten your babies. Yeah, but also bleaching and, and all of these things are, it, 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 it's a world issue for sure. But, you know, to the point, even with kids, I remember in high school, I would say, for what I didn't originally want children when I was younger, but I would always say if I was to have a daughter that I would only buy her black dolls. And I remember getting so much aggressive pushback, not just from my peers, but from the adults. And they're like, well, why would you do that? And that's racist. And I would say, well, but white people buy their children white dolls. And that's what they play with all day. And that's the definition of beauty. And so, but if I say I only want my child to have black dolls, then now I'm the problem. And it's crazy because to this day, I am very intentional about, and anybody who knows me knows, you know, don't bring my baby a white dog. Oh, I agree. Um, and it, it, it is not, it, it is not about 
the white doll or having issue with white people. It's for her to see beauty in something that looks like her and the people that are around her all day long. But that's what happens. The little girls, you give them that Barbie was forever white. Uh, your cat, they had a one cabbage patch doll that was dark, and then all of your other, all of your dolls, you have rows and rows and rows of toys. These white babies, and we are demonizing each other for wanting our children to have dolls that look like them. It's less now. But I still get a side eye if somebody gives my baby a white doll. I'm like, well, so you no, should. You. But you know, to your point, internationally, when I was in the Philippines, um, every skincare product, every lotion, every body wash had skin whitener in it. Wow. And my partner who was there with me training, he was a white guy who wanted to go to a plastic surgeon to see how much it would cost for electrolysis because he was balding in the top and he wanted to get electrolysis on the side. So I went with him. And we walk into the plastic surgeon's office. I sit down to read my book. He signs in, and the receptionist looks around him and says, are you here for skin whitening, ma'am? Wow. And so me, being the smart ass that I am, was like, no, I'm not going to be here that long, and this is all over, and it goes deep. <laughs> and, you know, Love but it. he's like, why would she ask you that? You know, he wanted to get into, why would she ask you that when I'm the one who's signing in? And I said, because when I walked in, she saw what she saw what, what I presented as exactly. being wrong. Exactly. And I had to be here to correct yes. that. And this is in the Philippines, for sure. And, then, and we can move that when you're talking about the whitening. That's a boom, booming is industry. Unfortunately, as much as we're trying to get back to our roots, mm -hmm. that is a booming, ish, booming industry in, in the continent of Africa mm -hmm. right now. A booming I I industry. And from several of my African friends, again, nothing's blanketed per se, but it is, you typically will not, amongst the kids, you don't, they don't have black dogs. So the much as you're saying, and the saddest thing I'm hearing you discuss that is, the idea of even the idea of even having to defend it, right? Right. Like, like that's the, that's the, that's just again to me, this just speaks to the psychological how embedded it is. And another thing that crossed my mind is how tired of we should be of black first, or when they do do a black mm -hmm. black bar because they do will do a black bar with yes. a black can, and it'll be celebrated to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. Now, some of us are tired of it being celebrated. So I'm not saying all of us are there, but I'm just pointing out even the need to celebrate it still keeps showing how deep how far seated yeah. this is. And then even if we were to go, as much as I want to, I've never taken a trip to the continent of Africa. I got different mm -hmm. countries I would like to travel to, Ghana in particular, or Kenya in particular. Uh, but to hear yeah. my Nigerian friend talking about how much trouble colorism is yeah. now there, or maybe if all, I don't know how long it's been that For way, sure. but I'm just pointing out that yeah. even if I were to go home per se, you know right. what I mean? To to know how deep it goes. And I guess as I'm talking about it, I guess that's why this was the topic today. Yeah. Is yeah. that we know that it's bigger than it is. Yeah. And I'm just saying I'm a little afraid that it's, it's not getting better exponentially fast enough Absolutely. for me to still experience those of you yeah. coming through my program who are kindergartners. Absolutely. And, because they're still exposed mm -hmm. to mainstream media yes. that defines Right, and even if it's not, you know, like it's with the widening or bleaching and things like that, but like we were saying earlier, the filters, all of the filters make you lighter. I remember the first time I went through filters and I was like, who is this woman? Oh, wow. <laughs> you know, it made me so light. So, yeah. And because wow. initially I'm thinking, oh, these are just, they were, in the very beginning to me, they were marketed more as, um, like a photographer would like smooth out your something. skin, not oh, not wow. to lighten you, but just smooth to smooth it out, right? And so, but I'm going through it, and they're just getting lighter and lighter and lighter, and it's like this is not me. Or I see somebody else that I've taken a picture with, and they use the filter, Pretty and much. I look mint, yeah. and I'm like, who who is this? Oh, wow. Because they chose to put the filter in there with them. Wow. on the picture, you know, wow. and it's just. But that's that's the start of it again for the kids because they're all on social media and every filter, even if it has bunny ears, it lightens you up first. What? Just putting so yes. not so just using the thing. That's why you okay. I don't use these things, so I'm just kind of learning. I just played around. But just using it yeah, does that. Absolutely. They all lighten you. 
none of them none of them just smooth you out or even make you darker like i would be down for a filter that made me a little more darker you know i'm totally maybe down with that give me some full lips. yeah <laughs> <laughs> nah i can take it oh, no, that, that one will cause which, a which is a whole nother conversation you know, even with the colorism piece, like that's a part of the conversation, but an, another big piece for me because my full lips were not celebrated at all. And I've always, want, I've, <laughs> I've considered Botox, collagen, the whole nine. I yeah, but it's cool lips. now. But I was, but in, I was in my I've late twenties before I even wore color lipstick. But see, I was made fun of because I wasn't darker because yeah. of my features, and so because I was made fun of, I've always wanted to be darker. I've always I've heard, wanted. I've heard some right. go through that. As I've heard go through that. that. Yeah, because I was picked on because I was called Pinocchio because my nose didn't spread. Mm. So. Well, we with that said, thank y'all. I think it's been a lively discussion. Again, this is our first Facebook Live. Please give us some feedback on the Facebook page, whether we should try this again in the future. Um, again, we're just trying to give y'all something to do on a Friday night. Typically, we would be at Urban Grind going back and forth just like this with an entire group. So I definitely want to thank Shadon and Latrice for holding me down. Shadon, thank you for um, sponsoring this evening. So what I want to do is give you an opportunity to let people know how they can get a uh, you know, some of these, some of these beautiful. I love yeah, Absolutely, she prints it. So go ahead and tell them about that before um, we go. Absolutely. So the beautiful wares that you see today, actually across the board, is me, huh? Because I made that shirt. Oh, yeah, you made that. Yeah, <laughs> okay, she, she, okay. she printed the Minute Dialogue shirt right. as well. So across so, the board, we had, she prints it all the way. So that is simply put, she prints it. Anything that you can think that you may need for your business or your family reunions or just a large gatherings and you want to be able to produce promotional products, t-shirts, um, whether it's to get closer to your target audience or just create brand awareness, that's what we do at She Prints It. And like I said earlier, it affords me the ability to celebrate women um, in all of our power and our greatness. I love these conversations because She Wear Club, which is our retail line that includes the dip and melanin, was created because a lot of what we go through is because we don't talk to each other. So I wanted to create apparel that celebrated women but also created conversations because if you just took a moment to have a conversation with someone, you would realize that you're more alike than not or at least be willing to celebrate your differences. So if you, I always tell people, if you don't want somebody, to, a stranger to stop you and ask you about your clothing or create conversation with you, then She Wear Club apparel is not for you because it's totally about creating conversation and being a true fashion statement. So our websites are um, for customization, promotional products, and things of that nature is sheprintsit.com. If you're on sheprintsit.com and you say, I want some of that retail wear as well, you can just hit retail line and go to the She Wear Club or you can visit www.shewear.club. Well, Latrice, anything you want to get out to the people? Or just check um, it? No, I just, I think that we need to continue to have these conversations more and more frequently. We do this once a month, but I believe in any of my friends know that any opportunity I get, we have a diversity conversation. Um, and I think it's the, the more we have these conversations and begin to get to the root cause of the issues within our community, then we can begin to develop solutions. Uh, great segue. Every Saturday we have these conversations if you're not in Atlanta. So if you're outside of Atlanta, please join us in the morning, 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for the Mental Dialogue Talk Show. If you're in Atlanta, go find us on meetup.com, mental-dialogue. Go find us and you'll see us having these, hopefully when we stop social distancing, we'll have a live experience again. So again, let us give us some feedback on this. We'll hopefully t tune in tomorrow, again, especially for all the parents. Please get these tips from a woman who is an expert at unschooling. You may not know that term. We'll tell you all about it tomorrow and homeschooling. I probably need some help out there. Help out there, y'all already haven't already torn your hair out. Mm. So thank y'all for tuning in. Appreciate y'all. Thank you, Jericho Broadcasting. Thank you, Money Motivation. Thank you, C. Prince. Thank you, Big Sis Media. We're out. All I ask is that you think. Toya Smith, A.K.A. Black Socrates. I am the owner and facilitator of the Mental Dialogue Community Support Group, focused on practical solutions and the collective thinking of the Black community. We do that one of two ways every third Friday, 7 p.m. at Urban Grind, or Saturday mornings, the Mental Dialogue Talk Show, 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Contact us at mentaldialogue.com or on Facebook at Mental Dialogue. All I ask is that you think.